Brian Samuel Epstein was a British music entrepreneur who managed the Beatles from 1962 until his death. Epstein was born into a family of successful retailers in Liverpool, who put him in charge of their music shop, where he displayed a gift for talent spotting. He first met the Beatles in 1961 at a lunchtime concert at Liverpool's Cavern Club. Although he had no experience of artist management, Epstein put them under contract and insisted that they abandon their scruff image in favor of a new clean-cut style, with identical suits and haircuts. He then persuaded George Martin of Emmy Group to produce their records. Within months, the Beatles were international stars. Epstein accompanied them to America, where he was besieged by merchandising offers, but had signed away 90% of the rights in advance. This is viewed as his one miscalculation. Some of Epstein's other young discoveries had also prospered under his management. They included Jerry and the Pacemakers, Billy J. Kramer and the Dakotas, Tommy Quickly, and Cilla Black. In 1967, he died of a sedative overdose, ruled as accidental, at the age of 32. Chapter 1 Ancestry Epstein was Jewish, his grandfather Isaac Epstein was Lithuanian Jewish and had arrived in Britain in the 1890s at the age of 18. His grandmother Dinah was the daughter of Joseph and Esther Hyman, who had emigrated from Russia to Britain with their eldest son Jacob. The Hymans had six more children. Isaac Epstein married Dinah Hyman in Manchester in 1900. In 1901, Isaac and Dinah were living at 80 Walton Road, Liverpool, with Isaac's sister Rachel Epstein, above the furniture dealership that he founded. Dinah, and Isaac's third child was Harry Epstein, Brian Epstein's father. Eventually the family moved to a larger home in the Anfield area of Liverpool at 27 Anfield Road. After Harry and his brother Leslie had joined the family firm, Isaac Epstein founded Epstein and Sons and then enlarged the furniture business by taking over adjacent shops at 6272 Walton Road to sell a range of other goods, such as musical instruments and household appliances. They called the expanding business NEMS, which offered lenient credit terms, and from which Paul McCartney's father once bought a piano. Epstein's mother Malka was also involved in the Hyman furniture business, which also owned the Sheffield Veneering Company. In 2003, the family home on Anfield Road was converted into a Beatles themed hotel called Epstein House. Chapter 2 Early Life Epstein was born on 19 September 1934 in Rodney Street, Liverpool. Harry and Queenie also had another son named Clive, who was born 22 months after his older brother. During World War II the Epsteins moved to Southport, where two schools expelled Epstein for laziness and poor performance, but returned to Liverpool in 1945. The Epsteins lived at 197 Queen's Drive, Childwell in Liverpool, and remained there for the next 30 years. Epstein's parents moved him from one boarding school to another, including Claysmore School in Dorset. He spent two years at Wrecking College in Wellington, Shropshire, where he was taught the violin. Shortly before his 16th birthday he sent a long letter to his father explaining that he wanted to become a dress designer, but Harry Epstein was adamantly opposed, and after serving a six-month's apprenticeship at another company his son finally had to report for duty at the family's furniture shop on a £5 per week wage. In December 1952, Epstein was conscripted to do his national service as a data entry clerk into the Royal Army Service Corps, and was posted to the Albany Street Barracks near Regent's Park in London, where he was often reprimanded for not picking up his army pay. After returning to Liverpool, he was put in charge of the Clarendon Furnishing Shop in Hoylake and was made a director of NEMS in 1955. In September 1956, he took a trip to London to meet a friend but after being there for only one day, was robbed of his passport, birth certificate, checkbook, wristwatch, and all the money he had in his possession. He did not want his parents to find out, so he worked as a department store clerk until he had earned enough money to buy a train ticket back to Liverpool. Back in Liverpool, he confessed his homosexuality to a psychiatrist, a friend of the Epstein family, 
who suggested to Harry Epstein that his son should leave Liverpool as soon as possible. During the sessions, Epstein revealed his ambition of becoming an actor, so his parents allowed him to go to London to study. Epstein attended the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in London. His RADA classmates included actors Susanna York, Albert Finney, and Peter O'Toole, but Epstein dropped out after the third term, saying that he had become too much of a businessman to enjoy being a student, and I didn't like being a student at all, he said in 1964 that he felt like an old man at the age of 21. He also revealed that he would have liked to produce a theatre play, or even act, in something by Chekhov, or a straight drama by John Osborne. Back in Liverpool, his father put his son in charge of the record department of the family's newly opened NEMS music store on Great Charlotte Street. Epstein worked day and night at the store to make it a success, and it became one of the biggest musical retail outlets in northern England. The Epsteins opened a second store at 12 to 14 Whitechapel, and Epstein was put in charge of the entire operation. He often walked across the road to the Lewis's department store where Peter Brown was employed. He watched Brown's sales technique and was impressed enough to lure him to work for NEMS with the offer of a higher salary and a commission on sales. Chapter 3 The Beatles Epstein first noticed the Beatles in issues of Mersey Beat, and on numerous posters around Liverpool created by his commercial artist associate Tony Booth, before he asked Mersey Beat editor Bill Harry who they were. Harry had previously convinced Epstein to sell the magazine at NEMS, with the Beatles featured on the front page of its second issue. The Beatles had recorded the My Bonnie single with Tony Sheridan in Germany, and some months after its release Epstein asked his personal assistant Alistair Taylor about it in NEMS. Epstein's version of the story was that customer Raymond Jones walked into the NEMS shop and asked him for the My Bonnie single, which made Epstein curious about the group. Taylor later claimed that he had used the name of Jones to order the single and paid the deposit, knowing that Epstein would notice it and order further copies. Harry and McCartney later repudiated Epstein's story, as Harry had been talking to Epstein for a long time about the Beatles, the group that he promoted the most in Mersey Beat, with McCartney saying, Brian knew perfectly well who the Beatles were, they were on the front page of the second issue of Mersey Beat. On 3 August 1961, Epstein started a regular music column in the Mersey Beat called Stop the World, and listened to everything in it, Brian Epstein of NEMS. The Beatles were due to perform a lunchtime concert at the Cavern Club on 9 November 1961. According to club owner Sidner, Epstein had visited the club quite a few times previously on Saturday nights, once asking Sidner to book a group for his 21st birthday party. Epstein asked Harry to arrange for Epstein and his assistant Taylor to watch the Beatles perform. The club allowed Epstein and Taylor to enter without queuing. They bypassed the line of fans at the door and heard Bob Wooler, the resident disc jockey, announce a welcome message over the club's public address system, we have someone rather famous in the audience today. Mr. Brian Epstein, the owner of NEMS, Epstein later talked about the performance, I was immediately struck by their music, their beat and their sense of humor on stage, and, even afterwards, when I met them, I was struck again by their personal charm. And it was there that, really, it all started. After the performance, Epstein and Taylor went into the dressing room to talk to the group. The Beatles, all regular NEMS customers, immediately recognized Epstein, but before he could congratulate them on their performance George Harrison said, and what brings Mr. Epstein here? Epstein replied with, we just popped in to say hello. I enjoyed your performance. He introduced Taylor, who merely nodded a greeting, said, well done, then, goodbye and left. Epstein and Taylor went to Peacock's restaurant in Hackenshay for lunch, and during the meal Epstein asked Taylor what he thought about the group. Taylor replied that he honestly thought they were absolutely awful, but there was something remarkable about them. Epstein sat there smiling for a long time before exclaiming, I think they're tremendous. Later, when Epstein was paying the bill, he grabbed Taylor's arm and said, do you think I should manage them? 
The Beatles played at the Cavern Club over the next three weeks, and Epstein was always there to watch them. He contacted Alan Williams to confirm that Williams no longer had any ties to the group, but Williams advised Epstein not to touch them with a fucking barge pole because of a Hamburg concert percentage that the group had refused to pay. Chapter 3 Section 1 Management Contract In an afternoon meeting with the group at NEMS on 3 December 1961, Epstein proposed the idea of managing the Beatles. John Lennon, George Harrison, and Pete Best arrived late for the meeting, as they had been drinking at the Grapes pub in Matthew Street. McCartney also did not arrive on time because he had just got up and was taking a bath, as Harrison explained. Epstein was upset, but Harrison placated him by saying, he may be late, but he'll be very clean. Lennon had invited Wooler to be at the meeting so that he could give his opinion of Epstein, but he introduced Wooler by saying, this is me dad. Epstein was reticent throughout the short meeting, only asking if they had a manager. After learning that they had not, he said, it seems to me that with everything going on, someone ought to be looking after you. He had further meetings with the group on 6 and the 10th of December 1961. MC Cartney, Harrison, and Best were under 21 and therefore needed the consent of their parents to enter into a contract. Best and his mother, Mona Best, owner of the Casbah Coffee Club, were impressed with Epstein's professional image as were the other Beatles, because he was a businessman, wore expensive suits, and owned a large car. Best's mother said that Epstein could be good for them. McCartney's father was skeptical about a Jewish manager and warned his son to be careful about finances. Lennon's aunt and guardian, Mimi Smith, was against the idea, believing that Epstein would lose interest when something attracted his attention, but Lennon, who had just turned 21, ignored his aunt's advice. The Beatles signed a five year contract with Epstein on 24 January 1962, giving Epstein 10 to 15 percent of their income. They signed a new contract in October 1962 which gave Epstein 15, 20, or 25% of revenues, depending on how much he helped the band earn. The Beatles would then share any income after various expenses had been deducted. Epstein then formed a management company, NEMS Enterprises, telling his parents that managing the group was only a part-time occupation and would not interfere with the family business. The Beatles signed Epstein's first management contract, but Epstein did not. He later told Taylor, well, if they ever want to tear it up, they can hold me but I can't hold them. The contract stated that Epstein would receive a management commission of 25% of the group's gross income after a certain financial threshold had been reached. The Beatles argued for a smaller percentage, but Epstein pointed out that he had been paying their expenses for months without receiving anything in return. On 1 October 1962, four days before the release of Love Me Do, Epstein signed Lennon and McCartney to a three-year NEMS publishing contract. In 1963, Epstein advised the creation of Northern Songs, a publishing company that would control the copyrights of all Lennon M.C. Cartney compositions recorded between 1963 and 1973. Music publisher Dick James and his partner Charles Silver owned 51% of the company, Lennon and McCartney 20% each, and Epstein 9%. By 1969, Lennon and McCartney had lost control of all publishing rights to ATV Music Publishing. Epstein's death in 1967 marked the beginning of the group's dissolution and had a profound effect on each Beatle. Chapter 3 Section 2 The Beatles' Appearance on Stage Epstein had no prior experience of artist management, yet he had a strong influence on the band's early dress code and stage demeanor. They had previously worn blue jeans and leather jackets, and they would stop and start songs when they felt like it or when an audience member requested a certain song. David Pommer and Sotmary states that when Epstein first saw them at the Cavern Club he thought, they were a scruffy crowd in leather, and they were not very tidy and not very clean. They smoked as they played and they ate and talked and pretended to hit each other. Epstein encouraged them to wear suits and ties, insisted that they stop swearing, smoking, drinking, or eating on stage, 
and also suggested the famous synchronized bow at the end of their performances. McCartney was the first to agree with Epstein's suggestions, believing that they reflected Epstein's RADA training. Epstein explained that the process from leather jackets and jeans to suits took some time, I encouraged them, at first, to get out of the leather jackets and jeans, and I wouldn't allow them to appear in jeans after a short time, and then, after that step, I got them to wear sweaters on stage, and then, very reluctantly, eventually, suits. Epstein took the group to Wirral to see his friend, Master Taylor Ben O'Dorn, who made them their first suits based on a design they had previously seen, but which Epstein approved of, I thought it was an excellent design at the time. Lennon resisted wearing suits and ties, but later said, I'll wear a suit, I'll wear a bloody balloon if somebody's going to pay me. Epstein began seeking publicity by charming and smarming, the newspaper people, as Lennon said in 1972. According to McCartney, the gigs went up in stature and though the pay went up only a little bit, it did go up, they were now playing better places. The group was now far more organized, having one single diary in which to record bookings, rather than using whoever's diary was at hand. The group usually called Epstein Mr. Epstein or Brian in interviews, but in private the group abbreviated his name to Epi or Brie. Chapter 3 Section 3 Record Contract Epstein made numerous trips to London to visit record companies in the hope of securing a record contract, but many rejected him, including Columbia, Pi, Philips, Oriole, and most notoriously Decca. On 13 December 1961, at Epstein's invitation, Mike Smith of Decca travelled from London to Liverpool to watch the group at the Cavern, which led to an audition in London on 1 January 1962. Decker informed Epstein one month later that the audition tapes had been rejected. The Beatles later found out that Epstein had paid Decker producer Tony Meehan to produce the studio recordings. While Epstein was negotiating with Decker he also approached Ron White, an Emmy marketing executive, who contacted Emmy producers Norrie Paramore, Walter Ridley, and Norman Newell, but they all declined to record the group. White could not contact EMI's fourth staff producer George Martin, as he was on holiday. On 8 May 1962, Epstein visited the HMV store in 363 Oxford Street, London to have the Decca tape transferred to 78 revolutions per minute acetates. An HMV disc cutter named Jim Foy liked the recordings, suggesting that Epstein should contact Sid Coleman, the head of EMI's record publishing division which controlled the publishing company Ardmore and Beechwood. Coleman liked the recordings and sent Epstein to Martin, the A and R manager of Parlophone. On the next day, the 9th of May 1962, Epstein met Martin at EMI's Abbey Road Studios. Supposedly, Martin had no intention of signing the Beatles after listening to the Decca recordings, but he offered a contract after learning that Epstein would cancel all his substantial NEMS business with Emmy. Martin denied this account by saying that Epstein's conviction that the Beatles would become internationally famous finally convinced him to offer a recording contract. He also later admitted that Emmy had nothing to lose by signing a contract with the Beatles, as the terms of payment were negligible. At this point, almost every other British record company had rejected the group, and Martin had never heard the group live. The Beatles were eventually signed to EMI's small parlophone label, which had very little experience with pop or rock artists. Upon signing the contract, Epstein immediately sent a telegram to the Beatles and to the Mersey Beat Music Journal in Liverpool. The recording contract gave the Beatles one penny for each record sold which was split among the four members, meaning that each earned one farthing per copy. The royalty rate was further reduced for singles sold outside the UK, the group received half of one penny per single, which was again split amongst the whole group. Martin scheduled the first recording session to be on 6 June 1962 at Abbey Road Studios. Epstein later renegotiated EMI's royalty rate and, on 27 January 1967 the Beatles signed a new nine-year contract with Emmy. 
The contract stipulated that 25% would be paid to NEMS for the full nine years even if the Beatles decided not to renew their management contract with Epstein, which was up for renewal later that year. Chapter 3 Section 4 Dismissal of Pete Best After the first recording session on 6 June 1962 Martin had one reservation, as he felt that using an experienced studio session drummer rather than Pete Best would improve the recording. Lennon, McCartney, and Harrison asked Epstein to sack Best when they learned that Martin wanted to replace him on their recordings. Epstein agonized about the decision, asking the Cavern's disc jockey Bob Wooler if it were a good idea. Wooler replied that Best was very popular with the fans, who would not like it at all. Epstein dismissed Best on 16 August, over two and a half months after the first recording session at Emmy Studios. Best was never given an explanation for his dismissal. Epstein initially offered the vacant position to Johnny Hutchinson of the Big Three, a group that Epstein managed at that time as well. Hutchinson turned down the offer, saying, Pete Best is a very good friend of mine. I couldn't do the dirty on him although Hutchinson did play for the Beatles at short notice when Best, did not turn up on the evening of his dismissal and for two subsequent bookings, until Ringo Starr was able to join. Starr was well known to the group, as he was then playing with Rory Storm and the Hurricanes, the resident group at Butlin's Holiday Complex in Skegness. He had also occasionally replaced Best when the drummer was ill, and had performed at a recording session with Lennon, McCartney, and Harrison in Hamburg. Chapter 3 Section 5, Beatles' Last Official Live Appearance in the UK The Beatles made their last official live appearance in Britain on 1 May 1966, at the NME annual poll winners all-star concert at the Empire Pool, Wembley Park. Although the concert was televised, the cameras were switched off while the Beatles played, because Brian Epstein and ABC TV had failed to agree over terms. They were filmed receiving their awards, however. Chapter 3 Section 6, After Candlestick Park The Beatles's hectic schedule kept Epstein very busy between 1963 and 1965 with touring plus television and film work. Their last live concert was at Candlestick Park in San Francisco on 29 August 1966, and Epstein's management duties then changed to reflect the changing nature of their career. He pressured them to continue touring, but they steadfastly refused. Chapter 4, Business Dealings Epstein once offered all four Beatles a fixed wage of £50 a week for life. Harrison remembered that he was earning £25 a week at the time, which was more than the £10 a week that his father was earning. The group declined Epstein's offer, believing that they were worth much more than £50 a week. NEMS had a staff of 25 at the time of its move from Liverpool to London in 1964. NEMS booked the Beatles's concerts, and it also presented groups as an opening act. It accrued money as promoter, booking agent, and manager for all concerts. The Beatles were constantly in demand by concert promoters, and Epstein took advantage of the situation to avoid paying some taxes by accepting hidden fees on the night of a performance, which he always kept in a brown paper bag. Epstein also successfully managed Jerry and the Pacemakers, Billy J. Kramer and the Dakotas, the Foremost, the Circle, and Scylla Black, as well as Tommy Quickly and Sounds Incorporated. He sent his roster of artists on package tours around the UK, a common practice at the time. This involved short sets by each act, alternating with a compare or a comedian. Epstein once revealed that even though he was entitled to be reimbursed by acts for expenses incurred, he paid for his own flights to and from the United States, as he did not see himself as being part of a touring group. Photographs, transport, and international telephone calls were paid from his own 25% share in profit stock the Beatles toured the Philippines in July 1966, playing two shows at the Rizal Memorial Football Stadium in Manila. Epstein unintentionally snubbed the nation's first lady Imelda Marcos when presented with an invitation to a breakfast party. He had politely declined on behalf of the group, as it was their policy never to accept such official invitations. 
The Beatles and their entourage were ejected from their hotel on the same day and given a police escort to the airport, even though Epstein had publicly apologized for the misunderstanding in a televised statement, which was not seen or heard because of static. The entourage boarded the plane for home, but Epstein and Beatles' assistant Mal Evans were ordered off, both believing that they would not be allowed back on the plane. Epstein was forced to give the tax authorities £6,800 worth of Philippine peso notes earned from the Manila shows and to sign a tax bond verifying the exchange before being allowed back on the plane with Evans. Epstein added the Vic Lewis organization to NEMS in 1966, and later brought impresario Robert Stigwood in as a manager. He once offered to sell the control of NEMS to Stigwood, without telling any of his artists about the offer. McCartney was taking a more active interest in NEMS finances, as it became known that some artists with more ruthless managers claimed to be benefiting from more commercially advantageous terms, such as the Rolling Stones under the management of Alan Klein. After Epstein's death, Clive Epstein assumed control of NEMS as the company's second-largest shareholder. Stigwood then tried to take over management of NEMS but all four Beatles vigorously objected, with Lennon saying, we don't know you. Why would we do this? McCartney admitted that they had always signed all the contracts that Epstein presented to them without reading them first, but after Epstein's death Lennon complained, well, he was all right. I've found out since, of course, that he wasn't quite as honest to us as he made out. Despite this, other interviews with Lennon report him as being loyal to Epstein's memory, we had complete faith in him when he was running us. To us, he was the expert. When asked in 1964 about his standing as a manager or businessman, Epstein replied, Fair, as a businessman, fair? I've got a business background, and probably a reasonable business brain. I'm no, sort of, genius. Asked about his deficiencies, Epstein replied, I'm probably too conscious of ideas, rather than finance behind ideas. Chapter 4 Section 1, Merchandising Before the Beatles achieved nationwide success in Britain, Epstein had permitted a company to produce Beatles sweaters for 30 shillings and badges for 6 pence. It sold 15,000 sweaters and 50,000 badges as the group's popularity grew. When Beatlemania swept the UK in November 1963, Epstein was besieged by novelty goods companies desperate to use the Beatles' name on plastic guitars, drums, disc racks, badges, belts and other merchandise. Epstein refused to allow the Beatles to endorse any product directly, but through NEMS Enterprises he granted discretionary licenses to companies who were able to produce good quality products at a fair price, even though many companies were already selling products without a license. During the first Beatles trip to the United States, Merchandisers pitched many products to Epstein, including Beatles clocks, pens, cigarette lighters, plastic wigs, bracelets, games, etc., but he rejected them all. This was because he had already allowed David Jacobs, the lawyer for NEMS, to give away 90% of merchandising rights to one Nicky Byrne, in the UK. This was later deemed to be a disastrous mistake, as it left only 10% for Epstein, NEMS and the Beatles. Byrne then took over Epstein's Strams Act merchandising in the UK and set up Celtab in the United States. While the Beatles were ensconced in the Plaza Hotel in New York City, Epstein was further besieged by calls and visits from promoters, retailers, television commentators and hustlers. Mindful of the number of records the group was selling in the United States, Capitol Records sent a well spoken Yorkshire woman, Wendy Hansen, to the Plaza Hotel to act as Epstein's secretary, and to filter his calls. Hansen later worked solely with Epstein in his Albemarle Street office in London, which was separate from the NEMS office. Lennon later said, on the business end he ripped us off on the Celtab thing, McCartney said years later, he looked at his dad for business advice, and his dad knew how to run a furniture store in Liverpool. Chapter 4 Section 2, Lenmac Epstein asked chartered accountant James Trevor Isherwood to set up a company to collect Lennon and McCartney's PRS payments, called Lenmac, which he did on 12 May 1964. 
When he first visited Epstein's office, Isherwood was surprised to learn that Epstein took 25% of the gross income, and not the 10% that he believed most other managers received at that time. All of Epstein's expenses were deducted from his artist's gross income, including office rental, staff wages, travel, telephone costs, and entertaining expenses. Before his death, Epstein knew that the renegotiation of his management contract would lower his management fee from 25 to 10 percent, and that NEMS would no longer receive a share of the Beatles' performance fees, reducing its revenues still further. Chapter 4 Section 3 Publishing The Beatles entered into a publishing agreement with Dick James Music, so James set up a company called Northern Songs. James and his financial partner and accountant, Charles Silver, would each receive 25% of the shares. Lennon and McCartney received 20% each, with Epstein receiving the remaining 10%. The Beatles' PRS income increased rapidly, so Epstein asked Isherwood to devise a way of avoiding the tax that Lennon and McCartney would owe. Isherwood suggested a stock market flotation for Northern Songs. He also suggested to Epstein that during the flotation Lennon and McCartney should move to houses near Isherwood's own in Isha. Lennon, Harrison and Starr agreed, while Epstein and McCartney remained in London. Chapter 4 Section 4 Promoter and Presenter After settling in London in 1965, Epstein rented an office in Monmouth Street, and later bought the lease of the Savile Theatre on Shaftesbury Avenue. He promoted new works by writers such as Arnold Wesker in productions that occasionally fell foul of the Lord Chamberlain for including obscene content or nudity. In 1966 Epstein reinvented it as a music venue featuring various U.S. acts. On 20 February 1967 Epstein sacked the manager of the theatre, Michael Bullock, for lowering the safety curtain the previous day shortly before the end of a Chuck Berry concert that Epstein was attending with Lennon and Starr. Two fans had climbed onto the stage to dance, the curtain came down, and they were pushed from the stage. Although Bullock had not given the order, he was held responsible. In the wake of the Beatles' success, Epstein was asked to appear on several music based TV programs in Britain. He also hosted a regular part of the US television show Hullabaloo, filming his appearances in the UK. Chapter 5 Personal Life Throughout Epstein's life he was known to be kind and caring to his family, friends of his family, and business colleagues. When Lennon married Cynthia Powell, on 23 August 1962, Epstein served as best man and paid for the couple's celebratory lunch afterwards. During Cynthia's pregnancy Epstein paid for a private room in a hospital and offered the Lennons the sole use of his flat at 36 Falkner Street, Liverpool, when they needed a home. He also agreed to be godfather to Lennon's son Julian. Chapter 5 Section 1 – Sexual Orientation Epstein's homosexuality was not publicly known until some years after his death, although it had been an open secret among his friends and business associates. While Epstein was in the British Army, he commissioned a tailor to make him an officer's uniform. He wore the uniform, when cruising the bars of London, but was arrested one night at the Army and Navy Club in Piccadilly by the military police for impersonating an officer. Epstein managed to avoid a court-martial by agreeing to see an Army psychiatrist, who learned of Epstein's sexuality. After ten months he was discharged from the Army on medical grounds for being emotionally and mentally unfit. Epstein later stated that his first homosexual experience was when he returned to Liverpool after being discharged. Epstein spent a year studying acting at RADA, but dropped out shortly after his arrest for persistent importuning outside a men's public toilet in Swiss Cottage, London. Cottaging, as it was called, was one of the few public ways that gay and bisexual men could meet at the time, especially if they were closeted. When Epstein first saw the Beatles perform he noticed their stage attire first, saying, they were rather scruffily dressed, in the nicest possible way, or I should say in the most attractive way, black leather jackets, jeans, long hair of course, McCartney said that when Epstein started to manage the Beatles they knew that he was homosexual but did not care.
because he encouraged them professionally and offered them access to previously off-limits social circles. Although Lennon often made sarcastic comments about Epstein's homosexuality to friends and to Epstein personally, no one outside the group's inner circle was allowed to comment. Ian Sharp, one of Lennon's art school friends, once made a sarcastic remark about Epstein, saying, which one of you does he fancy? Sharp was sent a letter by Epstein's office within 48 hours that demanded a complete apology. Sharp apologized, but was then completely ostracized. McCartney sent him a letter directing him to have no contact with any of them in the future. Epstein went on holiday to places such as Amsterdam, Torremolinos and Barcelona or Manchester at weekends, as the attitude towards homosexuals there was more tolerant than in Liverpool, even though Liverpool did have several gay bars. In his autobiography, Pete Best stated that Epstein drove them both to Blackpool one evening where Epstein expressed his very fond admiration. Epstein then supposedly said, Would you find it embarrassing if I ask you to stay in a hotel overnight? Best replied that he was not interested, and the two never mentioned the incident again. There were reports of a brief sexual encounter between Lennon, and Epstein during a four-day holiday in Barcelona in April 1963. Lennon always denied the rumors, telling Playboy in 1980, well, it was almost a love affair, but not quite. It was never consummated, but we did have a pretty intense relationship. Lennon's first wife Cynthia also maintained that Lennon's relationship with Epstein was platonic. A fictionalized account of the Spanish holiday, is featured in the 1991 film The Hours and Times. Chapter 5 Section 2 – Drug Use After the start of his management career, Epstein started taking stimulants, usually Preludin, which did not require a prescription at the time. Lennon, McCartney, Harrison, and Starr had also taken it since their days in Hamburg. Epstein explained his use of the drug as the only means of staying awake at night during numerous concert tours. In 1964 Peter Brown suspected that Epstein was taking too many pills, as he would often cough at parties, which Brown realized was Epstein's way of secretly putting pills into his mouth without anyone noticing. McCartney often met Epstein at late-night clubs in London, and remembered that Epstein would often grind his jaws, once saying to him, Buck, the pills. Epstein also developed dependencies on the drug carbromyl, a barbiturate-like sedative-slash-hypnotic drug. In 1964, after having been introduced to cannabis by Bob Dylan in New York, Epstein was observed by McCartney standing in front of a mirror, pointing at himself and repeatedly saying Jew, while laughing loudly, which McCartney found hilarious and very liberating. Epstein later became heavily involved in the 1960s drug scene. During the four months when the Beatles' album Sgt. Pepper was being recorded, Epstein spent his time on holiday, or at the Priory Clinic in Putney, where he tried unsuccessfully to curb his drug use. He left the Priory to attend the Sgt. Pepper launch party at his house on 24 Chapel Street, but returned to the Priory immediately after. Epstein added his name to an advertisement that appeared in the Times on 24 July 1967, which called for the legalization of cannabis, the release of all prisoners imprisoned because of possession, and research into marijuana's medical uses. The advertisement was sponsored by a group called Soma and was signed by 65 people, including the Beatles, Scottish psychiatrist R. D. Lang, 16 doctors, and two members of Parliament. Epstein responded to questions about the advertisement by saying, My opinion is that pot smoking is definitely less harmful than drinking alcohol. I am not addicted to either, but I have been very drunk and very high. In June 1967, after McCartney had admitted to LSD use, Epstein defended him to the media, stating that he too had taken the drug. Chapter 5 Section 3 – Gambling in August 1965, the Beatles and Epstein visited Elvis Presley at his house in Perugia Way in Los Angeles, where Elvis's manager, Colonel Tom Parker, set up a roulette wheel and several packs of playing cards. Epstein immediately asked to play, as he was known for his love of gambling. McCartney frequently visited gambling clubs in London, 
such as Epstein's favorite club Curzon House, where he often ran into Epstein. He once saw Epstein put a Dunhill lighter worth £100 on the table, then lose it during a game of cards. Epstein often lost thousands of pounds by playing Baccarat, or Chemin de Fer, but would stay at Curzon House the whole evening, eating an expensive meal and drinking fine wines. The club never presented Epstein with a bill, as they knew he lost so much in the casino. Chapter 6 – Death Epstein attended a traditional shiva in Liverpool after his father died, having just come out of the Priory Clinic where he had been trying to cure his acute insomnia and addiction to amphetamines. A few days before his death he made his last visit to a Beatles recording session on 23 August 1967, at the Chapel Recording Studios on Maddox Street in Mayfair, London. On 24 August, Epstein asked Peter Brown and Geoffrey Ellis down to Kingsley Hill for the bank holiday weekend. Approximately 50 miles from his home in Chapel Street, Kingsley Hill was Epstein's country home in Warbleton, Sussex. After they arrived, Epstein decided to drive back to London alone because an expected group of friends he had invited failed to arrive, although they did turn up after Epstein left. Epstein phoned Brown at 5 p.m. the next day from his Chapel Street house in London. Brown thought that Epstein sounded very groggy and suggested he take a train back down to the nearest railway station, in Uckfield, instead of driving under the influence of Tuinal. Epstein replied that he would eat something, read his mail, and watch Duke Box jury before phoning Brown to tell him which train to meet. He never called again. Epstein died of an overdose of carbrytal, a hypnotic preparation combining the barbiturate pentobarbital with the bromide carbromyl, in his locked bedroom on 27 August 1967. He was discovered after his butler who, having been unable to rouse Epstein via his locked bedroom door, called Epstein's PA, Joanne Peterson. She attended it and failing to rouse Epstein called his doctor who, along with the butler, broke down the door and found Epstein in his bed, appearing to be asleep, a book opened near his hand and some digestive biscuits on the nightstand. On realizing he was deceased, staff swept the house for contraband and then called the police. Epstein was found on a single bed, dressed in pajamas, with various correspondence, spread over a second single bed. At the statutory inquest his death was officially ruled an accident, caused by a gradual build-up of carbrytal combined with alcohol in his system. It was revealed that he had taken six carbrytal pills to sleep, which was probably normal for him, but in combination with alcohol they reduced his tolerance. The Beatles were on a retreat in Bangor in northern Wales at the time, with the Indian guru Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. Epstein had previously agreed to travel to Bangor after the August bank holiday. The second of two shows by Jimi Hendrix at Epstein's Thaville Theatre was cancelled on the evening of Epstein's death. Peter Brown wrote in his memoir, The Love You Make, an insider's story of the Beatles, that he had once found a suicide note written by Epstein and had spoken with him about it. According to Brown the note read in part, This is all too much and I can't take it any more. Brown had also found a will in which Epstein left his house and money to his mother and his brother, with Brown also being named as a minor beneficiary. When confronted with the notes, Epstein told Brown that he would be grateful if Brown did not tell anyone, and that he was sorry he had made Brown worry. He explained that when he wrote the note and composed the will he had simply taken one pill too many, and that he had no intention of overdosing, promising to be more careful in the future. Brown later wrote that he wondered if he had done the right thing by not showing the note to Epstein's doctor, Norman Cowan, who would have stopped prescribing drugs. The coroner, Gavin Thurston, told the Westminster inquest that Epstein's death was caused by an overdose of carbrytal and ruled it as an accidental death. The pathologist, Dr. Donald Teer, stated that Epstein had been taking bromide in the form of carbrytal for some time, and that the barbiturate level in Epstein's blood was a low fatal level. The Beatles did not attend Epstein's funeral, both to allow his family some privacy and to avoid attracting fans and the media. According to Jeffrey Ellis, chief executive of NEMS Enterprises, 
The day before the funeral George Harrison had given Nat Weiss, Epstein's good friend and confidant, a single flower wrapped in a newspaper on behalf of all four Beatles, with instructions to place the flower on Brian's coffin as a final farewell. However, flowers are forbidden at Jewish funerals and burials. Weiss and Ellis discussed this dilemma while walking back to the grave, where they observed two men beginning to shovel dirt onto the casket. Ellis later wrote, Nat, who himself was Jewish, cast the newspaper package unopened onto Brian's coffin, where it was swiftly covered by earth. Epstein was buried in Section A Grave H12, in the Long Lane Jewish Cemetery, Aintree, Liverpool. The service at the graveside was held by Rabbi Dr. Norman Solomon, who said, disparagingly, that Epstein was a symbol of the malaise of our generation. A few weeks later, on 17 October, all four Beatles attended a memorial service for Epstein at the New London Synagogue in St. John's Wood, which was officiated by Rabbi Louis Jacobs. The Bee Gees' 1968 song in the summer of his years was written and recorded as a tribute to Epstein. Chapter 7, Legacy Epstein was upset that he was not honored along with Lennon, McCartney, Harrison, and Starr when they received the MBE in 1965, though Harrison once said that the MBE stood for Mr. Brian Epstein, the Beatles were among the earliest entrants into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but Epstein was not included in the Hall's non-performers section until 2014, and not without controversy as he was inducted alongside Rolling Stones manager Andrew Lug Oldham who refused to attend in part in protest at what he perceived as the indignity of a joint induction. Martin Lewis, previously Taylor's assistant, created the official Brian Epstein website, which included a petition that Epstein be inducted into the Hall of Fame. Lewis also organized the 1998 republication, in the United States, of Epstein's 1964 autobiography A Cellarful of Noise. M. C. Cartney summarized the importance of Epstein when he was interviewed in 1997 for a BBC documentary about Epstein, saying, If anyone was the fifth Beatle, it was Brian. In his 1970 Rolling Stone interview, Lennon commented that Epstein's death marked the beginning of the end for the group, I knew that we were in trouble then, I thought, we've F. King had it now. In 2006 Cynthia Lennon said, I think Brian's one of the forgotten people. It's almost as if he's been written out of the story. I don't think they'd have got anywhere without Brian. The first contract between the Beatles and Epstein was auctioned in London in 2008, fetching pound 240,000. Epstein's influence on the Beatles and his complicated personal life continue to provoke controversy. In 2013 author Vivek Tiwari released the graphic novel The Fifth Beatle, The Brian Epstein Story. A film of the same name was scheduled for release in 2014, originally to be produced by Bruce Cohen and directed by Peyton Reed. Tiwari said about that project that the film would be less a music bio and more of an inspirational human interest story about an outsider. Tiwari and named co-producers Stuart Ford and Simon Cowell originally set the film for release in 2016, but in March 2016 it was announced that the project would be a television series. Epstein was once asked about the future of the Beatles and their fresh honesty, which the interviewer thought could be corrupted by time. He replied by saying, I think they will go in the reverse direction, and become more honest.